and good morning. Welcome to the Old Cowboy Talking About Jesus. I'm Pastor Jerry Bond. Today, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you and we praise you and we thank you for this awesome time together to study your word and to hear what you'd have to say about things that you're doing. We give you praise in all things, Father, because you're worthy and to be exalted and praised. We thank you for sending your son the best so we could have the best. We give you praise in all these things in Jesus' name and all the people said amen. We're going to talk about, behold, the days are coming. It was prophesied in the prophet Joel about 800 years, seven to 800 years before Jesus was born, that there would come a time when God himself would pour forth his spirit upon all flesh, both man, woman, both servants, said old men would dream dreams and Young men would have visions, and the male and female servants would all be filled with the Spirit of God. Well, in Hebrews, the Apostle Paul writes in chapter 8, verse 8, he says, Behold, the days are coming when I will do this. Well, we know that 2,000 years ago, approximately, we know that the, on a specific day, the Lord Jesus did something very awesome. He told the people, he said, I must go to Jerusalem. I must die, I must be crucified, I must die. And on the third day, I'm going to lay down my body and I'm going to raise this temple back up. And then on 50 days later, the Spirit of God is going to be poured out because I'm going to pray the Father and He's going to send forth His Spirit upon all flesh and the fulfillment of time would come. Now the reason God did this is so that you and I would understand that God chooses not to live in a building any longer. He doesn't live over in the, in the temple in Jerusalem. He doesn't live in the church that you go to or I go to. He doesn't live there. He lives in the heart of the people. Our body, 1 Corinthians 3.16, is the temple of God. So he says, behold, I'm going to do a new thing. I'm, over in Isaiah, he says, I'm going to uh, change things up. I'm not going to do the old things anymore. I'm going to do new things. Well, we're going to talk about the old covenant was was waxed old, and God brought forth a new covenant. He brought forth a better covenant. He brought forth a better plan for mankind, that mankind, through the redemption and the shedding of Jesus' blood at the cross, that blood would wash every person from Adam to the end of times and cleanse them from their sin. Now, if you go back and study Hebrews 8, 9, and 10, you're going to find some very interesting things. One of the things, it says that the priest would enter once a year into the Holy of Holies beyond the outer court, and there he would take the blood of bulls and goats, and he was sprinkling on the mercy seat, and therefore the people for a year would be have a forgiveness of their sins for a year. But they still had consciousness of their sins. But God had a plan that through the shedding of Jesus' blood in Hebrews 9.26, 9.22 and 26, he says the blood would be shed and it would re take away the, the memory, the thought of sin. In other words, cleanse their consciousness from it. Another thing he said that God had a plan in the ninth chapter, in the 10th chapter where he talks about, he says, God gave me a body, a God who prepared a body that was prepared especially for this sacrifice that once and for all, in Hebrews 10.10, 10, once and for all, that mankind would be forgiven of all their sins with the exception of the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, curse God, curse Jesus, do all the ungodly things that man does, all the sinful things and all the different kinds of sinful things, and every one of those are forgiven if a man or a woman repents of their sin because God is just and merciful to forgive us, 1 John 1, 9. Amazingly enough, you're going to see something about this. Let's, let's refer to Joel 2, where 28 through 20, uh, 32, where he says, I'm going to pour forth my spirit in those days. Well, if we want to, want to read and see how this was all come to about, let's, think, let's go through the life of Jesus, who is our living example. In John chapter 7, verse 37, 38, and 39, he says, Come to me if you're thirsting, for righteousness and you shall be filled. He says, if you believe in me, come. And he says, out of your inward most parts, out of your belly, the deep part of your whole being would come a river of living water. And he was talking about that the Holy Spirit would be poured forth and given after his resurrection. Notice that everything that was done and is done is done in exact 
God's timing, exact God's planning. Jesus himself did nothing until he became the Levitical priest age of 30 years. And, he, and in Luke, the fourth chapter, he went down to the river. Therefore, he was baptized by John. And John the Baptist said some interesting things there. And all four gospels bring this up. And let's talk about this for a moment. He says, there's one coming after me. He said, I must decrease and the one coming after me must increase. And he will bring forth and his winnowing fan will clear the threshing floor. And he will baptize the people with the Holy Ghost and with fire. And then we see that Jesus came and he was water baptized. He went down into the water and he came out and the Spirit of God came upon Jesus in the form of a dove. And a voice out of heaven says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And then you see the Father, the Son, and you see the Holy Spirit, the tri Godhead of the whole realm of God's business. So you understand that. Then he was led and driven in one place and driven in one place into the wilderness where he was tested by Satan. We know that he defeated Satan three times there with the word of God. Thou shalt live by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And then he says, thou shalt not test the Lord thy God. And then he says, he shall give his angels charge over you. Then he says he left Jesus for a more opportune time. Always remember there's seasons in our life where we're very victorious and there's seasons in our life when we're tested. There's seasons in our life where Satan will come and try to tempt you or try you or bring you out of God's will. That's when you need to resist him. And, in, and, and over in Peter he says, if you resist him, he will flee from you. He's like a roaring lion in James and he comes around looking for someone to devour. Notice he just roars. He just tries to steal the word out of you. So we're looking at behold a new day. What is really happening? Well, Jesus was a living example. He went about teaching this and in Luke eleven thirteen, 13, he gave us some direct quotes there from his own mouth, his wisdom. He said, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give you the Holy Spirit to those that ask? So when we ask the Father, after we've been born again, we asked him that we believe in our heart that Jesus hung on the cross and he died there and he was buried and he was in the tomb for three days and nights and on Easter Sunday morning he rose and gave us victorious life over death, over hell, over the grave. He gave us God's love walk, God's eternal life and lives in us and we have these things. Then he told us, he says, if you being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give you the Holy Spirit to those that ask? So we must ask him to fill us or baptize us with the Holy Spirit. Then he tells his disciples in Luke 24, 49, he says, go and tarry and wait until you've received power from on high. So they go into Jerusalem and they get in a room that's prepared especially for the Last Supper and they're there and there's approximately 120 folks there. Now, one thing you must understand, this was not all that happened there. Jesus, between the time that he was resurrected on Easter Sunday morning and, and the day of Pentecost, he showed himself to more than 527 people. And you can read that in 1 Corinthians 15, where he came, he showed himself, and they felt the, the nail holes in his side and in his hands and in his feet, saw where the Spirit entered his side and one thing or the other. And then they were in the upper room and the door was bolted shut and Jesus appeared to them. So therefore he had that body of immortality that the apostle Paul saw in the great visions that he had. Now one of the things you must get in your mind right now, you want to get this in your ground, in your understanding of ground level things about the Lord. God had a plan that he would redeem mankind and through the atonement and the death and the burial of his son Jesus that he would restore man back to himself. And when he did this in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, the apostle Paul gave us an insight that we were a new creation. We were not an old sinner saved by grace. We're a new creation in Christ in the anointing. And he saw that. And so he was brought forth in that time, in this special time. Let me show you something very special about this. On the day that Peter got up to preach, on the day of Pentecost, you can read it in Acts 2 verse 4. It says, on the day of Pentecost, when the, spirit, the time had fully come, the Spirit was poured out as prophesied in Joel. It was prophesied by Jesus in his words, in the Gospels, in the Gospel of John. It was prophesied by Luke in the Luke's Gospel where Jesus said these things were going to happen. 
And he told them, he says in Acts 1, 4 through 8, he says, go, wait in the upper room and you shall receive power to be my witnesses in Jer Jerusalem, Samaria, and, and to the uttermost parts of the ends of the earth. And he told them this, that they would receive power. Now we see a lot of church people that walk around and they have a form of godliness, but they have no power because they have, according to Thessalonians 5, they have quenched the spirit and they have not allowed the Holy Spirit to fill or to baptize the congregation with the Holy Spirit. A lot of people never enter into this, this part of the kingdom or this part of the riches of the kingdom of the Lord Jesus. John had some revelation into this in, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 20. It says, you have an anointing from the Holy One from Israel. In 27, he says, you have need for no one to teach you, but the Holy Spirit will teach you all things, and he will always glorify me. So he's telling you the real truth. Well, we go back to Acts 2, and on the day of Pentecost, when it had fully come, Peter, a, a sound of a mighty rushing wind came, and there were tongues, cloven tongues, and it appeared and it entered upon all the people, and they were from every part of the known world, spoke different languages, yet they could understand themselves. This was the heavenly language that the Apostle Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 2. It says, when you have a heavenly language, when the Holy Spirit baptizes you, he gives you a heavenly language, that in this language you talk to God and man does not understand unless the interpretation is given. And that's part of the fruit, excuse me, of the gifts of the Spirit where we have the interpretation of tongues and tongue. And then in Mark 16, it says every believer should pray and have an unknown speaking new tongue. This is the new thing. And Isaiah says out of the stammering lips and the, and the mouth of babes shall I do this new thing. So he told us and prophesied through Isaiah, through Joel, through Zechariah 4, 6, it says not by power or might, but, the, but by the Spirit of God, says the Lord. So when you begin to understand who you are in Christ, who you have been brought up and baptized into the likeness of him. Let me give you some a real example of what the Lord gave me on this. Up to this point, only in, under the old covenant, which was the law, and the people were told, thou shall not. But under that only, the prophet, the priest, or the king had the anointing to do things. Elijah, Elisha, David, Samuel, Nathan, some other folks, and we know that King Saul did, and then he lost the anointing. There, are, there is many places in the New Covenant where you can find in the book of Acts and the, the epistles where the, the folks were, were filled with the Spirit of God and did supernatural things in the name of God. We are given God's name. We're given God's power. We're given the love of God, which is in Romans 5, 5. We're buried in the likeness of Christ's death when we're born again and water baptized. We're baptized in the likeness of death and we're raised in this new life, this new God's life, eternal life. But it was sealed on the day of Pentecost when the Spirit was given to every individual that will believe. Now, if you want to, if you want to get into a little discussion, and this is pretty interesting, in Acts chapter 2, verse 37 through 39, it says, Come, and to those that are near and to those that are far off shall receive the Holy Spirit. Notice you have to ask. Notice something else about that. All folks can receive the Holy Spirit because it was prophesied. Now, some denominations believe that you get the fullness of the Holy Spirit that day. Well, in, in John 1, verse 14 through 16, it says we have the fullness of grace upon grace. In other words, we have everything. Now, you cannot just get a little bit of the Holy Spirit. You get all of the Holy Spirit because he is a person of the Godhead. Now, a lot of people believe that they were born again and they, when they got saved and they got all of the Holy Spirit. But if you will go and you will study John chapter 3, verse 16, where it says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would have eternal life. That is one thing that happens to you. That is the new birth. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, we become a new creation. Then he doesn't contradict himself when he tells you go and receive the Holy Spirit, which is something more than your salvation. Now, a lot of denominations do not teach this, but it is the full gospel of Christ. It is the full gospel of what Jesus told us. Now, if you want to really get down in the, into the deep part of this, go study John 14, John 15, John 16, John 17. Jesus talks here very in depth about the things of the Holy Spirit because he knew that he had to leave for him to 
for him to go in John 16, 7, he says, it is expedient that I go so that the spirit shall be given. Now we're talking about behold, the days are coming. Well, if you go from, from when Pentecost in 2000 years ago to present day, we have seen moves of the Holy Spirit. A lot of people have made fun of them. I heard some people on Family Christian Radio a few days ago making fun of the things of the Spirit of God. I've heard people say unkind things about people that walk in the things of God. I've heard people that say these things, and I I would say this to you. If you do not have the understanding, be very careful what you say about the Holy Spirit because there is no forgiveness if you blaspheme him. Now, that's not my telling you. That's what Jesus said in Matthew, the 12th chapter, verse 32 through 35. Do not, please don't say anything derogatory about the Holy Spirit because when you do that, you become a reprobate of mine. And you go to Hebrews 10, verse 26 and and on verses there, you're going to see you can no longer put Christ back upon the cross because you have to crucify him again to your sin. So don't do those things. Don't get off in that, that side of, of not knowing. If you don't understand, just be still till you have the understanding. You know, you cannot work cattle and go out and gather cattle in the, in the canyons and the bushes and the, the cedar trees and the mesquites, and you cannot do these things unless you have some experience. So what I'm telling you from experience, I have watched great ministers of the gospel get all twisted off and get hung up on the tongue business. It's not the tongues, folks. It's Jesus. He is the baptizer of the Holy Spirit. He gives us the Holy Spirit. And he tells us in the gospels, he says, in the latter days, behold, it's going to come to pass where the Spirit is going to be poured out on all flesh. And that is going to be a great move of God, a great revival. You're going to say, Bon, you're, you're goofy. You're talking about things you don't understand. Let me show you something from the past experience. The day Peter spoke in Acts chapter 2, that particular day, 120 in the upper room were filled with the Holy Spirit. Another 3,000 people got saved and were filled with the Holy Spirit. A few days later when Peter and John in Acts chapter 3 came up to the temple and there was a man who had been sitting there crippled in his body and a lot of people have trouble understanding and and receiving healing. But Jesus is by the stripes on his back through the through the stripes on his back and the, the wafer that we take when we take communion, that represents our healing. And we take it unworthily, therefore we do not have our healing. So we must take that, that bread there is our healing and we must speak it and receive it. And so he's telling you that day they walked up there and he says, silver or gold have I none, but what I do in the name of Jesus rise and walk. And the man got up, had been there for 40 years, crippled in his feet. We know these things happen, but people will not receive. And also because of that man's great healing, 5,000 people were saved. Not because they were witnessing about Jesus, but they were witness to the miraculous power of belief in his name. Go read it in, in Acts 3, verse 16. It says it's on the basis of faith in Jesus Christ's name that this man was made whole. And then it's 19. It says, receive this. It's a time of refreshing. So when the, in, in 2 Corinthians 3, 17, it says where the spirit of the Lord is, there's absolute liberty and the Lord is that spirit and we're translated and transformed from glory to glory in the image of our Savior. And in John 14, 26, he says when the Holy Spirit comes, he will teach you all things. And then we, we realize that the Holy Spirit is going to talk about, in 15, 26, he talks about, he's going to teach us all about and witness all about Jesus. So when we have the witness of Jesus, people see that and they want him as their Lord, their Savior. And, is, and we glorify our Father God, who is a spirit, John 4, 20 through 24. He is a spirit. And so you must worship him in spirit and truth. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth. So we worship him in Jesus and we worship him in the Holy Spirit because he is the spirit of truth. When you begin to understand this, great joy will come upon you because the joy of the Lord is your strength. And when you begin to realize who you are in Christ, that Jesus said in John 14, 16, he said, I'm praying the Father that he will give you the Holy Spirit. And if you study this out, you're going to find that no one, until the day of Pentecost was saved because the Holy Spirit had not been given. No one could receive Jesus. No one. Now they were, yes, they were all looking forward to the cross, but he had not been resurrected. And without that resurrection and the, and the filling of the Spirit of God, we are not brought out of that bondage of death, of hell, of the grave, of that sinful nature. 
But once we come out of that and we're baptized in the likeness of his death and receive the, the infilling of the Holy Spirit, then the fruit of the Holy Spirit will operate in us. Love, joy, and peace, and patience, and kindness, and long-suffering. And he brings us where we realize that God gave Jesus a special body, and that body would be the ultimate sacrifice for all mankind and deliver mankind even from the thought of sin. There's a place in 1 John 5, 18 where a man or a woman does not sin. When you get so full of the Spirit and so full of the Word, the enemy has no place in you. You can read that in John 14, 27. Some of you may have heard some of my sermons before, and it may sound a lot like this, but the Spirit of God wanted us to see and know. If you go back through the Old Covenant, you're going to find in, in Jeremiah 31, 31, it was prophesied, I will take out that stony heart, and I'll put a new heart in you, a heart of flesh. Go to Ezekiel 36, verse 18 or 19, and said, I'm going to take that heart out. I'm going to put a new heart in you. Then you come over here to Hebrews 8, 9, and 10. It says, I'm going to write my laws upon your heart, and I'm going to take away your sins and your iniquities, and I'm going to write them upon your mind, and I'm going to be a father to you, and you're going to be my children. That is the new covenant where God himself has come and poured himself, the Spirit of God. God himself is pouring himself into every individual. He spoke to me in a, in a tongue here not too long ago, two different separate occasions. He said, all across the face of the earth, more than a billion people are going to come in this last great roundup. This behold, the days are here. He says they're going to come and healings and miracles and the, the, all across the nations. And there's going to be a tranquility, a quietness where the spirit of God is given. And he's poured out and every person. The spirit of God will hover over every individual all over the face of the earth. And there, it won't be a revival, but it'll grow be a great outpouring, a move of the Holy Spirit of God, of God himself upon the people for the great roundup that he's doing to bring people to the realization that they need a savior. And he's calling you, he's calling me to be a witness. What is Jesus doing in your life today? Do you believe he's Lord and savior? He is the healer. He is the master. He does this by the power of the spirit in you and me. You can see all through, the, all through the Bible where the Spirit of God would come and things would begin to happen. Without the Holy Spirit, we we're, uh, we're, we're just really don't have anything to do. In John, John 15, verse 5, he says, I am the vine and you're the branches, and without me you can do nothing. Well, what do you do? You get full of Jesus, you're full of the Holy Spirit because you're full of love, you're full of joy, you're full of peace, and you have that in the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, you have no recognition of who you are in Christ because the Holy Spirit draws us and teaches us all things. Go read John 16, verse 12 and 13. He said, I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot receive them. Well, when you come to a place where you become full maturely in the Holy Spirit, in other words, spiritual, you begin to understand the deep things of God. And it talks about that in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 8 through 14, where the Spirit of God searches the hearts of man and teaches us the deep things of God in the very thought of God by the Holy Spirit. And we have the mind of Christ and the mind of God. When we do that, we walk in the power thereof. And behold, the days are upon us when we come forth as a light in a dark world and we're seated up in heavenly places and we share that good news of who Christ is in our lives and what he's doing in the individual. That he died upon that cross and the stripes him on his back, he healed mankind. Blind eyes see, deaf ears open, cripples are, are healed and cancers and lepers are, are cleansed and then the dead are raised. I saw a woman that was stage four cancer a few days ago where she was totally made whole by the, by the stripes of Jesus by no, with no medicine. I've seen God do mighty and glorious things because he wants to please and, and do things to show you that his son is the Lord of Lord and the King of Kings. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you and we praise you and we thank you for this awesome time. We thank you that your word is true and it is never fails us that your son hung up on that cross that we might have life and have it abundantly and that the enemy would be bound and he would not be able to steal, kill in our lives because we're covered by the blood of Jesus. In Revelation 12, 11, it says Satan is defeated by the words of our testimony and the blood of Jesus. So we therefore move and walk in the things of the spirit. We do not walk in the flesh. We walk in the things of the spirit.
spirit and we do not honor the things of the flesh. We do not yield to the temptations of the flesh. We're more than conquerors through all things, through Christ who has delivered us from sickness, sin, and disease. He has no place in us and we're filled with the very presence of Almighty God. The Holy Spirit of God lives inside of us and he prays through us the per perfect prayers that God would have us in Romans 8, 26. And then we know that everything and all things work together for the good of the people. We know this because you love us so much, Father. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray. And all the people said, Amen. Today, please subscribe to our daily devotions at PastorJerryBond.com. There you can view the TV schedule, replays of our shows, and subscribe to our social media. You know, there's a place where you can just get aboard your old Cavallo and ride up alongside of us and partner up with us and just be a blessing to the people around you. And, and there's a place there for donations. It says pastorjerrybond.com slash donations, and you can go online and do that. Or you can send a check or a money order or however you'd like to do it to pastorjerrybond.com, Pastor Jerry Bond, Post Office Box 51542, Amarillo, Texas, 79159. You know, we just thank you for partnering up and being part of the glory of God. You know, we ought to come together all denominations and all people and realize there's only one God and his name is Jehovah and there's only one son and his name is Jesus and there's only one Holy Spirit and he lives in every one of us and we ought to come together we ought to glorify Jesus we ought to be in unity in the bond of love we ought to walk together we ought to praise praise God and pray for each other and pray for the leadership of the nations of the world so that the tranquility of God will move and the harvest will come and the people will rejoice and be born again you know, we just want to thank you and praise you and give you, give you all the, we just want to bless you for partnering up with us and helping us take the message of an old cowboy talking about Jesus to all over this nation and around the world. We've seen people saved everywhere and people healed. We're seeing all kinds of miracles. You know, it's just when we come together in agreement and walk together in agreement that Jesus is the Lord, he is the Savior, he's the Redeemer, he's the Healer. He has not changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so we praise him, and all the people came together in his beautiful name and said, Amen.